Thanks especially to Longchen and the Luan Academy for arranging this diverse set of simulating speakers. Um, I'd like to offer some comments um, and I'll try to keep them brief so we have time for joint discussion um, in response to Elena and Stephen, but also actually in response to intersections with um, ideas that Scott and Andy presented earlier this morning or this evening. Um, I wanna talk about the role of diversity in teams and respond to some ideas that we've heard about that and also the role of cultural diversity. Um, so we heard from Scott about this really interesting idea about diversity in teams in terms of diversity in um, cognitive styles and how that impacts the outcome of the team and um, diversity in cultural um, backgrounds within a team. And this actually is brought to mind, in fact, I assembled these slides whilst um, Scott and everyone else was speaking, some of my own interests in research about diversity in teams. It's different from diversity um, that is standing diversity, but it has to do with diversity achieved through dynamic pairings within a team. So there's another kind of diversity that can occur within a team when individuals are forced to shift around who they play with. And so this is a very recent um, research where we've studied how a bunch of individuals who are actually identical in their uh, objectives, they're all kind of selfish individuals trying to, trying to optimize their own payoff, um, behave in a population when they're forced to sort of switch partners at a certain um, rate. And so the basic idea is that individuals are playing a complicated game. It's actually an iterated prisoner's dilemma where it's hard to achieve a good outcome but once in a while they have to play the game with someone new. And that mere fact of switching up who you're interacting with in your team um, produces diversities of um, strategies over time that would not exist if the team were consisting of single stable pairs. And, as, and the result of this for collective outcomes can be profound. Um, if individuals play only against a single opponent over time and they're selfish, then we have this tragedy of commons and people end up over time having very poor payoffs and complicated tasks like the iterated prisoner's dilemma. But if they're forced to switch partners over time, um, then the population as a whole can achieve a good outcome. And this is a kind of diversity that's achieved not through individual differences, but just through ephemeral interactions with different individuals within a team. And I think this is sort of interesting and maybe related to things that Scott mentioned. Um, one of the interesting points here is that it's a good collective outcome. So there's a huge literature on multiple agents and trying to learn how to do a problem. Some of that literature just wants to find one agent who can you know, solve a problem really well. Here, however, the goal is for the whole population to sort of collectively solve the problem well. And this is relevant for some tasks like self-driving cars where the goal isn't to get just one car that's good at avoiding collisions. You have to have all the cars um, good at their task. So, there's a kind of diversity that can be achieved dynamically, even if all the individuals have the same kind of in inherent programming. So that's the one thing I wanted to say in response to um, some comments from Scott. Um, but I also have comments um, in response to some, in some uh, ideas from Elena and Stephen um, on the role and maintenance and production of diversity in ecological and biological systems and how that might be reflected um, and how ideas from those theories can be um, used to study the, what promotes diversity in social and cultural systems. Um, and I'll try to bring this up by talking about a topic that might seem a little bit weird to begin with. I wanna talk about a cultural trait um, that is super diverse, which is just our first names, um, at least in the United States and uh, many Western countries, there's an enormous diversity of first names. I um, mean, there's lots of things that go into producing diversity of first names. There's boom bust cycles, which also happened, by the way, in biology. Um, there's perennial favorites and so on. And what I've worked on over the last few years and finally finished um, is a way of trying to understand what, what kind of role of selection, which we heard a little bit from Andy Lowe, um, might play in promoting um, the dynamics and diversity of cultural traits like first names. And um, We've looked at, in some sense, all of the first names in the United States over a long period of time, and as well as other countries. And the key thing that we've looked at, um, and this draws a little bit on what Elena was talking about, is one of the classic ideas from ecology, which has to do with frequency dependent selection, that the benefit of one type may depend upon its current frequency in the population. And in particular, if rare types are more beneficial, 
um, or have a higher fitness, then that can stimulate diversity. Um, and so we've worked hard to learn how to infer, infer the form of frequency dependent selection that's operating in any given cultural system from time series data. And indeed we infer that there is this very strong negative frequency dependence operating on baby names um, in a whole range of different countries. So that the rare, the rarest names for the most part are really the most fit. You want these kind of, you want as a parent, you want to give your, endow your child with a cool rare name. The really common names are boring and have negative growth rates. Um, and this is, this basic, this really simple idea of broad from ecology, but now quantified from time series data is to a large extent what explains the diversity of names in all these different countries. In fact, the actual shape of the abundance distribution of names can be explained by the form of frequency dependent selection. This weird shape of the abundance distribution that has a kind of, um, that has a kind of, uh, that has a kind of elbow here at a certain frequency is explained by what frequencies are preferred by selection and what more common frequencies are disfavored by selection. Um, so this is a way of thinking about what are the selective forces, even complex selective forces that pattern the, the structure of standing diversity in a cultural trait. Um, so there are also maybe sort of subtleties that, that um, occur in, um, in culture. Um, where different subsets, di different subsets of the population experience different types of selection that produce different patterns of diversity. And so one example, again, here in names has to do with biblical names. As you guys might guess, biblical names, you might think have an advantage, the, the Johns and the Davids and so on. And indeed, we do find that um, separating biblical and non-biblical names, there's a very, biblical names have about a two and a half percent fitness advantage almost at all frequency classes compared to non-biblical names, so that different portions of the populations, different subsets can experience different types of diversity producing um, selection. And nonetheless, the biblical names show the same overall pattern that the rarer the biblical name, the more cool, the better, the more desirable it is, and the really common biblical names, the less desirable they are. And so we can think about these biblical and non-biblical names perhaps as different sectors of the population, and I'll comment that on that at the very end. The last thing I wanted to say has to do with um, boom-bust cycles, where again, we've looked at another cultural trait, which is pet dog breeds, which have been collected by um, collectors and are known to undergo fashion cycles. So um, Long Chen also mentioned the importance of fashion cycles, which can produce boom-bust patterns. And you might think would sort of boom-bust patterns might kind of drive out diversity. And what we have found, however, is that even though there's strong boom-bust patterns, the overall effect of those boom-bust patterns is to have negative frequency dependent selection that actually supports diversity. And so, um, although I can't go into all the details right now, um, that basic idea is that even in cultural traits that show strong boom-bust patterns, there is sort of an effective frequency dependence that ma maintains diversity of traits over time. Um, and that can be understood through frequency dependent selection. Now, the thing I want to close with is the idea of trying to infer the forms of um, selection that are operating, not just on baby names and, and, and dogs, which are just sort of toy cases, but are operating on things like firm size and um, lots of the sort of more economically important topics that people have mentioned before. This is, I think, open or terra incognita. Like we have a lot of time series data on firms. In fact, um, We've discussed with Martin a collaboration. Now I think we're finally ready to pursue it. And hopefully we can take some of these ideas from evolution and ecological theory to understand and infer how frequency effects um, drive the diversity and also the dynamics and turnover of um, other, other cultural organizations, not just your first name, but the size and um, lifetime and life history of, of companies. So that's all I have to say, and I would hope I'm hopefully I'm leaving enough time open for general discussion. Thank you all very much.